Assume that your app is insecure. Assume that anyone that is determined can and will find the info they're looking for. And then now think about how you can minimize that risk. Hey, devs, and welcome back to another episode of the Goobar podcast where we talk about building great software and helping others to do the same. Here we have short chats about things like software development and building your ideal career in tech. We aim to foster a sense of community, connection, and inspiration so we can all continue to dream, learn, and create. This week, I want to talk about app security, specifically mobile app security, and being really, really specific, Android app security though the concepts will apply equally as well to iOS applications. App security is something that is vitally important to businesses and to individuals that are possibly working with customer data, working with third-party services, or, or even working with your own custom services. Even if you're not making money with your project, say if you're working on an open source project, there's still a variety of security concerns to be aware of and mitigate. Now, while these security issues are very serious, there also seems to be a rather glaring lack of security-focused information and discussion out there. Be honest, how many resources on app architecture have you viewed, uh, listened to, or read in, say, the last six months or the last year. I bet it's a whole lot more than the number of resources on on app security. And yet app security poses this very real threat to kind of our our businesses and to the, the functioning of our applications. So in this episode, I want to chat through a high level overview of Android app security and some action items to help improve your project security today. Hopefully there'll be at least a couple takeaways from this that could spark some ideas that you could go and uh, immediately look to integrate into your project. We'll talk about ways to improve your app security, the security of your source code, and of your infrastructure. Now this isn't meant to be a strict list of things that you must immediately go out and address in your project but rather a list of things to be aware of. Some of these items require very little effort and you might be able to address right away. Some might not be applicable to your project and others might simply be not worth the investment of time and resources at this point in your project's life cycle. This podcast is supported by awesome listeners just like you. If you enjoy the podcast and find this episode useful, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. It helps out the show and lets me know how to best serve you all with future episodes. If you have a question or would like to suggest a future topic idea, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to podcast at goobar.io for your question or topic to possibly be featured in a future episode. And now let's dive in to today's topic. So app security, mobile app security. Why is this important? Well, it's important in a number of ways, and I am certainly not a security expert, so I'm going to miss some, I know. But a few of the the high-level reasons why security is important. It's important to protect your users. It's important to protect your business. And it's important to protect your, your finances. So when we're protecting our users, we want to think about protecting their personal information. We want to protect their passwords, their payment info, their medical info. We need to establish trust with them, and we can't do that if their information is being easily hacked or being easily leaked to the system. Now, we want to protect our business by preventing fraud. We want to ensure that our services aren't being misused. We want to protect the reputation of the business by making sure other people aren't out there uh, representing themselves as us by, by stealing our signing keys or something. 
And finally, we want to protect the the finances, whether that be the finances of ourselves personally or the finances of our our company or our team. You know, we don't want people using our app for free if it's a paid app. We don't want people changing the value on cash outs of their payment account by by hacking the app in some way and changing a $5 payment to a $50 payment. And and we don't want people using our third-party service accounts for free either and not having to pay for them by having us foot the bill for them. So there's a number of ways here that this concept of security becomes important to teams. So then the question really becomes, how then can we minimize these security risks from our app? And again, there, there's a lot of things to go about here. And I want to try and keep this at kind of a high level. So the first thing I'm going to say here, and if you don't take anything else away from this, this might be a decent takeaway. Assume that your app is insecure. So again, I'm just going to say that again. Assume that your app is insecure and that people out there can and will try to make it do things that it's not designed to do or try to crack it and get information out of it. And also you want to think about beyond your APK, beyond the the actual app that is insecure and is being sent out to users and installed on their devices. What are the other ways to minimize risk from your app? Now, what about your, your source code? What about your CI infrastructure? You know, how are you communicating with other services via the network? These are all areas that we can think about minimizing risk to protect ourselves and our users from any type of uh, threat of, of hacking or, or maluse. There, there are many possible vulnerabilities to attack and similarly, many possible ways for us as developers to eliminate these attacks or at the very least to make them more difficult. And, and in many ways, that's what we have to try and do. Thinking, how can I 100% eliminate any risk of, of attack, any risk of uh, security issues in our app? It's very difficult to, to say that for sure. In the same way that we are trying to protect our apps, others might be trying to, to break them down. So instead, I think it's often more helpful to think about how can we minimize risk? How can we evaluate our unique project, understand the risk vectors, and then be able to work uh, against anyone trying to take advantage of those attack vectors and, and minimize those risks. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some of those risks. We're going to talk about a couple different sort of attack vectors or, or risk vectors in our applications, talk about a few things that we can do to help mitigate those, and hopefully by the end you'll have a better sense of what we're talking about here. All right, so the first section of sort of risks we're going to talk about are all pertain to our, our app itself. So, so in the Android world, that's our, our APK or our app bundle that's out there being installed onto the devices. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is how we might better secure our, our source code itself, the code that's actually installed out onto the devices. And one of the ways that we can help secure that is through obfuscation. Now, what is the potential risk here in our in our compiled code? Why might we want to think about uh, making that code harder to work with? Well, the risk is that if someone has our application, they have the the compiled version of our code. They have the, those binaries. They have all of those class files on the device packaged up into our our APK. They can then decompile that code. They can change that back from the the, the packaged APK back into uh, effectively source code, very similar to what it, we originally wrote and compiled that APK from. And so the risk there then is that they can understand 
how our application works. They can understand what services they're using. They might even be able to start finding important information in there, like like API keys for services that we're using, and they could go on to to misuse those and to cost uh, our our team or our companies or ourselves money. So the the possible solution here, or the possible way to mitigate this risk, is through code obfuscation. Now, if you haven't heard of obfuscation before, it basically means the the deliberate act of creating source code that is difficult for humans to understand. So rather than having a class named maybe location manager, after the code is obfuscated, that class might be renamed to something like ABC. Now ABC is understandable by the compiler, but someone reading your source code and trying to understand how your project works isn't going to understand how ABC works all on its own. Now, when that is applied across the entire board, it results in a source code or decompiled source code that is much harder to follow and therefore harder to understand, harder to crack, harder to misuse. Now, in the Android world, this obfuscation is handled by the R8 compiler tool, uh, which is the, the default tool for code shrinking code obfuscation as of Android Gradle plugin 3.4.0. So there's a good chance that your projects are set up to start using this already. Now, like I said, R8 is specifically a program for shrinking and minification. It converts your, your Java bytecode to optimized uh, Dex code, and sh uh, it does that by by shrinking the names, changing these names, making them uh, sort of more more efficient in terms of memory used by by the compiler and the Dex files. But the byproduct of that is also that it makes it more difficult to understand by humans trying to read it, and that's a good thing in the sense of security. Now you might be wondering, well. If I change the names of all my files and, and classes and variables, how am I going to understand you know, crash reports, for example? Well, a byproduct of this deobfuscation process is that we get, um, or excuse me, a, a byproduct of the, this obfuscation process is that we get deobfuscation files. These are sort of the, the key to let us reverse this process. So we can upload these deobfuscation files when we upload our apps to Google Play, and we can use those to sort of send the names back to their original versions so that we can better understand them. So this lets us get the benefits of this obfuscation, but not have it hinder our, our development and our maintenance of the product. Now obfuscation, at least in the, the Android space, and I think that's probably the same in uh, many domains, is something that we have to opt in to. So for, uh, for, for Android, for example, we can add rules to a ProGuard file in our application, reference that in our apps build.gradle file, and then we would need to explicitly enable that during say a release build or some type of RC cut build. Now the process for doing that is uh, pretty pretty clearly lined out in the docs, and I'll include a link to the documentation for code shrinking and obfuscation in Android in the show notes. So you can check those out to learn more about how to actually implement this in your app. It is something that is pretty straightforward, probably requires only a few lines of code, and is a very, very good idea if you're thinking about uh, releasing a production application out there into the wild. Okay, so... That is how we can go about starting to secure the, the source code or the compiled code really that is sent out to our users. Now, one of the big other risks coming from the, the actual application that's out there in the wild are our API keys. You know, we use a lot of third-party services in the Android space and, and in the mobile space in general, and those keys often require uh, that they are available to our, our classes very early in our app's startup. So this often then means that those keys are present in the, the compiled code itself. 
And what's the risk of this? Well, the risk is that people decompiling our apps and examining that code will find our keys, be able to easily find what those keys are used for, and then be able to, to use them uh, and you know use, use the third-party services on our dime effectively. A lot of services have an API key so that they can understand how much they need to charge you for using it. A good example is a Mapbox, which is a which is a mapping service, and you have a key, and that helps them track how many offline map tiles are you downloading. For example, if someone else gets a hold of your key, they could start downloading tiles and effectively charging it to your account. So we don't want that. How then are some ways to to protect these API keys, whether it's in the compiled app that's out there in users? or even just in our in our source code, in our GitHub repos, for example. So the first step that we can do, and I really want to stress this because it's maybe one of the easiest things we can, we can do here to start improving the security of our projects. I, but that tip is to not check API keys into your repo whenever possible. So this means that let's say you need some type of API key for your authentication service. If you can avoid it, don't check that out or don't check that in to to Git. Leave it out of Git. Pull it in at compile time only so that someone browsing your source code on GitHub can't see that API key. Someone that downloads your code from GitHub, they won't see that API key included in the project. So this is sort of sub security through absence. If the key's not there when browsing the source code, then they, the, the attackers can't find it. Now, if you do need to include them in your repo, say for ease of integration, another step that you could take to at least make it a little bit more secure would be to, to encrypt those keys. You might even go so far as to uh, move your API keys into a native code layer. So in the Android space, that might be having a module in your project that relies on the NDK and is written in C++. You could then encrypt those keys, store those into the native C++ code, and then consume those in your app via this native module. Now, and the reason for this, and it sounds like a lot of work, but the reason for this is that the native code becomes a little bit harder to decompile and, and crack. So again, it, it's not impossible, but it does make it uh, much harder for people to easily come across your keys and understand what they're being used for. Now, one other thought here on how we might uh, protect our API keys is to pull and validate those keys from an external server and possibly not even have them in our application, whether that is in the, the compiled source code um, or, or even really at, at runtime on their own. We can move those to some other secure server that we control. We can make a request to get the keys when those services are needed in our app, and we can, we can validate those in a number of ways. And we're going to talk about protecting network traffic next, because we definitely want, would need to make sure our network traffic is secure for this approach. But that is one possible way to go about this. Now, it's probably not the best approach for, for many applications. For example, if you have Firebase crash reporting and you want crashes across the life cycle of your application, having to make a network request to get your, your Firebase API keys is probably not a very good approach because you're going to miss out on collecting crashes from any time before you get that API key. But there may be other services that are maybe isolated to a specific part of your application where moving that key and a key validation to some type of external network request uh, might make sense. Next up then, protecting network traffic. This one is, is, is very important. And again, there are some quick ways to improve this. And then there are some more complex ways. And you'll have to evaluate whether those are right for your project. But again, before we dive too much into how to improve this, what's the risk vector here? Well, 
if we're communicating with other services, whether they're our own services, whether they are third-party services, we are sending information back and forth. And for many modern applications, this information can be sensitive. This can be uh, user's information, uh, PII, personally identifiable information, things like usernames, passwords, email addresses. Uh, you might be building, let's say, a, a, a healthcare app or some type of medical app. And so this might include sensitive data like medical information. This could include payment information, uh, social security numbers. It can include a lot of important information that you do not want to uh, be, be exposed and to have easily available to anyone trying to kind of crack your application. So how do we go about this? How do we go about protecting our, our users and, our, and ourselves from uh, any type of malicious use of our network traffic? Well, uh, the, the first one is to make sure that any, any services that we're communicating with are using HTTPS. We want to make sure that these, these services and endpoints have you know, a valid uh, certificate behind them, that they are secure to, to eliminate sort of those types of easy um, malicious vectors, people, uh, people that might be uh, trying to do um, malicious things with those endpoints by trying to, to spoof them, uh, by uh, attempting man-in-the-middle attacks. If we're using uh, secure endpoints here, that goes a long ways towards mitigating those risks. Now, and another easy way to help minimize some of these risks is to ensure that we are not using clear text traffic in our applications. And I have a, a link to more about this specific piece uh, in the show notes, but basically clear text traffic means we would be sending our data um, in, in plain human readable text in our requests. So this might include things like sending a username and password in clear readable text that says username blank and password blank. Uh, that's not good. That makes it really easy for someone to, to observe our packets as they're going over the wire and to be able to pull out useful bits of information. So ensuring that clear text traffic is not allowed and that that traffic is encrypted as it is going over the wire, that is a, is a really good way to help start securing our network uh, traffic. And now the, the next two that are a little bit more complex, um, but again can give added layers of security here, uh, th these are to set up trusted security authorities for our app or to actually pin a specific uh, certificate for our application. So as we're communicating with, with a service or an endpoint, we can set up certain trusted security authorities that say, okay, if this uh, certificate is coming from this particular you know, uh, authority, we're going to go ahead and trust it. But these other types of authorities, if we don't know where it's from, we don't particularly trust it, we're going to ignore that, uh, and these requests are not going to succeed. And then taking that to kind of the, the extreme or even the further level, we might say, well, we control this server, so we know exactly which certificate this server is using. And so we might want to pin a specific certificate to our app, or we want, might want to include a very specific certificate to identify our application's traffic to the server. We can pin these, give them known expiration dates. We can give them kind of fallbacks so that when we have to uh, cycle certificates, we don't uh, lose or we, we don't start breaking our applications. Um, but basically what this does is it makes it so that we have to see a very, very specific certificate or the traffic will fail. So this means that if someone is trying to launch to say a man in the middle attack, or they're trying to do something malicious to some backend service that we're attempting to use, unless they have this certificate that we know, trust and expect, uh, those requests are not going to succeed. So it really helps shut down uh, some of those um, attack vectors on our network traffic at the cost of, you know, some more maintenance for for our side. So so pinning a certificate is maybe not something worth doing if you are, you know, just starting out and you barely have any users or something. But as your application scales, as your as your team is really scaling and security starts to become a larger concern, uh, that very well might be something that you want to consider. 
All right, now the the last one that I want to talk about in terms of the actual compiled application that's out there for for your users. And this one is all about protecting on device info. And so again, what what is the risk vector here with the info that we're saving on the device? And while this one really is about kind of uh, PII, personally identifiable information, we don't want to share, uh, save, or, or really even use PII on the device whenever possible. Uh, so again, one of the maybe best takeaways that come out of this episode for you would be to just not use personally identifiable information whenever possible. And if you have to use it, again, do not save it to the device if possible. And especially don't save it as clear text. You know, Don't save out a username and password to shared preferences or to your database and have it plainly readable as username and password. You know, if you are saving personal information to your device, uh, try and make sure that it is encrypted or obfuscated in some other way. When you are authenticating users, uh, try and use some form of token authentication if possible so that you're not actually saving a username and password on the device and you're saving a token. And tokens, they tend to be more secure by default. They have expirations. They are uh, not human readable in any meaningful way. So if your token is leaked somehow from your database or something, uh, it's not as big of a deal as the username and password. And let's say you do need to save username and password some way, or you do need to save some type of uh, key identifier or other information. There are encryption and and key store APIs built into the operating system to give sort of really foundational OS level security for your information. Uh, Some of these uh, APIs and tools let you um, store and access that information without it ever really even entering in the, the process in sort of an unencrypted way, which gives you probably better security than you would be able to create and uh, roll out yourself. So again on this one, be very judicious in any type of personal information that you're saving on the device. Try and avoid it if you can. And if you can't, make sure it's secure. Try and avoid putting it into shared preferences, which is really easy to find and uh, misuse on the device. And if you're going to put it into your database, Maybe consider encrypting that information first. Uh, Consider storing this information in an encrypted secure key store or or other storage um, option within the the OS itself. Try and make sure that your user data is as secure as possible. So we talked about a handful of ways to try and improve the security of our APKs, of the, the actual app that's out there to the users. But there are other sort of security risks and attack vectors to consider when when building a mobile application. And one of them is securing your developer identity. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we are shipping mobile apps, we tend to sign those apps. And signing those apps is really sort of our digital signature, usually for for our, our company that lets, let's say, Google or our users know, hey, yes, this came from us. This came from our company. You can trust it. This is us. Well, what happens if that signing information is leaked somehow or someone else gets a hold of it? Well, they could start signing applications as if they were you. They could release their own versions of apps that are maybe doing illegal or malicious things and have those look as if they came from you. This is obviously a huge deal, and we want to avoid this if possible. So the way to go about this in the Android space is that we need to protect our our signing key store and the associated keys and passwords. And there are a few different ways that we can go about sort of securing these and improving the security of this information. The first is that when you create a key store or you create your passwords and keys for that key store, 
you want to make sure that you're saving a copy of this in some secure location. So maybe that's a password manager, like one password. Maybe that's a, a special directory on your machine where you keep really important information. Uh, maybe that is a, a secure hard drive that you have for backing up important stuff. But you want to make sure that you can get this if you forget that information somehow or let's say your your computer crashes or something. You want to make sure you have a backup because if you can't get that signing information again, you're largely out of luck and you're not going to be able to continue signing your apps with that same signature, which means that if you need to put out a new version of your app, it's going to look like it's coming from someone else, which is not an ideal experience and might uh, cause people to not trust your app or might think that something uh, shady is going on. So make sure that you back up your, your key store and the associated passwords. Now, a common thought or maybe one of the one of the first places you might think to back up the key store and the passwords and the keys is to simply check it in to your uh, your source code control your your git repo for example this is not a good idea <laughs> i will i will say this very emphatically do not check your key store and your passwords and keys directly in to your source code especially if that is a public repo now, why is this such an important thing? Well, think about it. If your source code for your application is sitting there and in that same repo, you also have your key store, which includes your, your custom, your unique signing key. And then you also have the, the alias and the password for using that key store. Then someone that gets a hold of your source code has everything they need to go out there and release that project as if they were you. There's nothing stopping them. It would look exactly the same as your application would. Or they could start changing it, doing malicious things, releasing it as you, and it would still look the same as you, but now it's doing very different and very uh, not good things out there. So, so don't check those in. Don't put all of your eggs into a single basket. So the first step to this is pull out the, the keys, pull out the, the key store password, uh, the, the alias, pull those out. There, there are ways of doing this, and I've included the link to um, some resources on this from the Android developer site. The, you can find that link in the show notes. Um, but, but it's very common to pull those out into some type of, um, you know, let's say keystore.properties file that lives on a developer's machine your, your build can pull those keys in at compile time through, say, Gradle project properties, and that information will be there to sign the app during the build process, but the keys aren't actually checked into source code, so you can't find them in your Git repo. So that's, that's one step, is to pull out the keys. Don't check the keys into the repo. You might also consider pulling the key store out of the repo as well, just as another level of security. It might take a little bit more work to be able to um, access that key store and have it available at the time when you need to sign the app, but it would provide even more security from this type of uh, developer identity theft in this sense. And then to go even further this, you might think about who or, or where you want your app to be signed from. If you check in the, the key store and the password to the repo itself, then Anyone with the source code can uh, build and sign your app. So this includes, you know, developers on their local machines. This includes anyone getting access to your source code um, that shouldn't have access to it. And if you, let's say you pull out your keys, you could still have a way to, to give your developers the needed keys and they could still build and sign your apps uh, locally, which is, is okay. But it also means that anyone on your team can can release this app. It just makes it inherently less secure because more people have access to this. So you might consider whether you want that to even be possible. You might say, we only want releases to be signed and releasable from our CI workflow, for example. So you might only put those keys into some type of encrypted key store in CI so that the only place a signed build can come from is your workflow. So this just consolidates the number of places capable of actually building 
this and that are actually touching these keys and these aliases and such, um, which again, just makes it a little bit more secure because there's just fewer places to leak that information from. So along these same lines then, you know, if we've now secured our, our developer identity through securing our, our signing keys and our key stores and such, um, another thing to consider here is just securing your source code itself. You know, and, and how how do we do that? Or or better yet, how how might someone get access to our source code? How what do we need to think about when we wanna wanna shut this down? Well, someone could take your your project and release it as your own. So that's one of the risks here that we're looking to avoid. Uh, someone might view your source code, find proprietary information in it, and go out and integrate that into their own app. So we want to avoid that. And then again, back to this idea of API keys, someone could review your code, whether it's on GitHub or your laptop or someone else, they could find your API keys and they could start using services as you without paying for them. So none of these are, are, are good things. So we want to make sure that our source code is uh, secure and is only accessible by people that we trust. So the first way to do this is to simply make sure that our source code, whether it is in GitHub, uh, GitLab, Bitbucket, wherever we have our source code, make sure that the visibility rules or the, the um, access rules for your project are set properly. You know, don't have a public project if it's not meant to be public. Um, don't have a project maybe open to everyone in your company if not everyone in your company is... Um, is let's say trustworthy or you feel that needs access to this information or, or maybe a better example is if you're using let's say an org on github maybe there's people in your org that aren't necessarily full-time employees of your company or even even employees of your company in any sense so you might want to limit access to not the whole org but maybe only your your developer team or maybe to only people that actually um, work for your company so whatever kind of the scope is here, make sure that you're not inadvertently letting people access your, your projects that shouldn't be. Another sort of easy step here is to require two-factor authentication for anyone um, accessing your code. Just gives another layer of identity um, security here and helps prevent people from kind of being able to, to hack their way, force their way in to an account and get access to your code. You could even take this further. Um, this is more something for kind of enterprise level teams, but there, there are enterprise level sort of security and domain validations for projects. Um, I know there is on, on GitHub, there probably is for, for other source control systems as well, where you can do things like um, validating the domain of the, the email address that's accessing the code. Um, I think uh, it's possible to set this up with things like Google's identity aware proxy even that uh, that adds a, a whole sort of enterprise grade level security before you can even access the source code. So again, if, if you are working, let's say on a larger team and you don't feel that your project is particularly secure, you might be able to look into some of these um, higher level security features to ensure that your code isn't being accessed by people that shouldn't be. And now uh, a couple here that have nothing to do with your source code itself, but uh, simply your development machine. And these, again, these are fall into the category of very easy things that you can do. Uh, you can pause this episode right now and go out in and do this and improve the overall security of your system. And so the first one here is to just make sure that your development machine is password protected. If you are working with um, vital code, whether it's your own code, your, your team's code, whether this is a, some type of a project that you're working on with multiple people, make sure that you have a password on your computer so someone else can't sit down onto your computer and, and start using that code, start finding that code and doing malicious things with it. And then in addition to making sure you have a good password on your computer, Make sure that that password is required when the computer falls asleep or, or is put to sleep and, and make sure that it falls asleep or is put to sleep quickly and often. You know, if you're working at 
a coffee shop or, or a library or something in a public place and you get up for 15, 20 seconds, you might not think to put your computer to sleep. But that could be plenty of time for someone to pull open your web browser, download your source code, and uh, be on their way before you even notice. And once someone has your source code, if you're not doing things like hiding API keys and such or hiding proprietary information, they might have plenty they need to start taking advantage of your system. So anytime you get up and you walk away from your computer, um, make sure that it requires a password to get in and uh, you'll be able to sleep a little bit better at night um, without having to worry about whether or not you have uh, allowed inadvertent access to your, your team's systems. All right, now the, the last sort of area here I just want to touch on regarding security of our overall system, and that is securing our, our CI tooling. So again, what is the, the risk here? Um, and, and the main risk I just want to chat about for a moment here is that if we have moved API keys, let's say, out of our project, we still need them at some level generally to, to compile and build our apps. And so often these mean moving these keys to our CI pipeline in some effect. The idea being that during our CI workflows, we can pull them from some CI uh, store and have them available to, to our project. Well, the risk here is that if those keys are not stored in a secure way in the CI pipeline, or if they are printed out to logs in some plain text way, this just becomes another place which that information might be leaked. So again, we just want to make sure that we're not leaking anything that uh, is, is important or could cost us uh, money or uh, security concerns. So you want to uh, make sure that you are hiding and encrypting your keys, whether they're API keys, identity keys for service accounts, anything important, follow a couple of basic rules. Don't store those as plain text in your CI config files. You might consider encrypting keys before, before putting them into a secure store, or your, you might uh, double check see if the kind of secure store is encrypting them automatically for you. You wanna make sure that you're not logging those out for, for debugging purposes in your workflow. Um, if you're using a system like, let's say, GitHub Actions or something, you might want to double check that the output of those isn't trying to get access to those in any inadvertent way. And then also, you want to make sure that you are protecting the, the auth credentials for these accounts. So again, if you are accessing um, your CI system, make sure that those credentials are saved somewhere like 1Password so you can get access to them. Um, and make sure that those credentials aren't laying around for anybody to come in, access your system, and be able to poke around and maybe find information that they shouldn't be able to find. Alrighty, so that is it for now. Hopefully this episode helped give you a little bit better of an idea of some of the potential risks and attack vectors for your project. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm not a security expert, but these are things that I have sort of worked on in different projects to, to help secure our systems a little bit more. Hopefully this has just given you some, some brainstorming fodder or just a few things to think about and you can go out and find more detailed information on how to really lock down and improve the security of your, your code, your, your APKs, your workflows, etc. And remember, you know, I have resources uh, for links on how to do some of this stuff in the show notes below. So you can check those out if you want to start learning more. So just to close us out here, remember, assume that your app is insecure. Assume that anyone that is determined can and will find the info they're looking for. And then now think about how you can minimize that risk. Let's say someone does get access to your app and they decompile it. What will they actually be able to find? And how can you make sure that that is not anything useful? How can you protect your user's data? How can you protect the security and financials of yourself and your company? What can you do to protect your source code and your developer identity? If you keep these questions in mind as you scale your project, you'll go a long ways towards minimizing the risk for your project and all those that care about it. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave a review and be sure to subscribe for future chats about software development and career. And remember, if you have a question or topic idea, I'd love to hear from you. And you can send those into podcast at goobar.io for your question or idea to possibly be featured in a future episode. 
Thank you so much for listening, devs. Remember to dream, learn, and create, and I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until next time, devs.